As with choice rules, the basic cardinality rules are rather restricted and not so uh, general as we've, we've seen before. But actually, this generality again can be compiled down as we will now see in a sec. Now, let's get started. So the purpose, of course, of all these types of cardinality rules, in particular the, the special one here, is to control the cardinality of subsets of literals. Here we restrict ourselves to the lower bound. So actually a cardinality rule is a rule that has a, 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 just an atom in the head. And the body is a single um, expression like this, where we have here a normal body, a set of positive and negative literals in a set, and here a lower bound on them. And this lower bound is a non-negative integer. So you can write zero or anything positive. And the informal meaning is that the head of that of this cardinality rule, A0, belongs to the stable model. If you more or less count how many of the elements here in the body are true in the stable model, and if you have uh, L or more of them, then the body is true and the rule fires and gives you A0. So more or less here with, with the positive uh, body literals, it's about being included in the stable model, being true in that, and with the negative ones, it's about being false or not being in the stable model, right? That's more or less the meaning. So as before, we all, uh, let's look at first as, as a more natural example. So this here is about when do you pass a course? So if you, there are three assignments, A1, 2, A3, and if you pass at least two among them, then you pass the whole course. Well, little small example. Now let's like, look at a little technical one but technical only because I use letters A, B, and C. It's not really complex. So here again, we have our fact B. B is true. And uh, here we say that if at least one B or C is true, then we get A. Well, since B is a fact, this thingy here is true. The rule applies because the body is satisfied intuitively and we get A. As a result, we get A and B and a single stable model A and B. Okay, again, given, giving semantics to this now was just appealing to your intuition and the informal meaning here, but with the translation, we can again make this precise, and let's do that now. So what does it take to apply a cardinality rule? In fact, the first thing we have to do, we have to count how many members of this set here are satisfied by the current stable model candidate. So counting is actually um, the central operation that we have to do. And once we have the result of counting uh, the elements in this set that are satisfied by the stable model candidate, we have to compare the result with the lower bound. So counting and comparison are the central operations, more or less, that underlie more or less the intuition uh, of this language construct. So let's actually see how we can do that by mapping this back onto normal logic program rules. So the idea, and this is of course oversimplified is now, whenever we see such a rule here, we map it onto a rule of this form. Now, hmm, what is happening here? First of all, we see that the head is simply copied to this rule here and the more or less the, the application condition that is described by this uh, construct is delegated, delegated to this auxiliary predicate x and to arguments 1 and l. Now x actually is our counter and x implements a counter for us. I was first tempted, or actually in, previ in previous editions of the lecture I had a, a name counter or CTR but then I thought, after all, we are just, it's just an auxiliary predicate uh, with the obvious meaning and actually having only x is much tinier on my slides than counter. Anyway, so x gives us a counter. And what does it count? Actually, it counts from the leftmost position, which is 1, to the end and checks whether we have at least L uh, satisfied literals. So the idea is actually that we, that, that's how the implementation now works. We, we, we start here from the, from the end of this, um, um, of this sequence and then check each atom and check whether it is satisfied. 
And when we arrive at one, and this is actually what this x1 here symbolizes, we should have seen at least L satisfied a literal. That's more or less the idea. And now, of course, when we look at this, this is a set, but the implementation uh, treats it as a sequence. And it doesn't matter whether positive or negative ones are now in any sequence, they can be arbitrary. But the idea is if we have n elements, we put them in a, in a sequence and we start by counting from the last element to the first one. One could also envisage, envisage this differently. This is just the, the trick that I'm following here. And when we have seen them all, then we check whether we've seen uh, at least L satisfied ones. Now let us look at the implementation of this counter of this infamous predicate X. Whenever we see an instance of predicate X, let's say Xij, the idea is that Xij is true whenever we are at position i and to the right of it we have seen uh, j at least at least that's important at least j elements or j uh, literals that have been found to be true in the current stable model candidate okay that's the idea of predicate ij again with here the instance with one l it says well when, when we are at position one then we have seen including uh, a1 uh, at least l literals that have been part of the or that have been satisfied in the current stable model Okay, that's the idea. Now let's see actually how we can implement this now. Now the, here uh, we have more or less three categories of, of rules. We have uh, here pairs of rules for the positive elements, pairs of rules for the negative elements, and a last rule that initiates the counter here. Now let's go through this step by step. Now for each positive uh, atom here we have a pair. And the idea is if we are at position i plus 1, and we have seen at least k elements. So if we then see that ai is true, that is we have a proof, then if we move to i plus one to i, so we move actually from the right to the left, uh, we augment the counter by one because we have seen ai. So we add actually, oh, we, we, our count, we increment our count. If we have not seen ai, then the counter stays the same. And actually keep in mind, so in, in case ai is true, both rules will actually apply. But since the, the, the second argument says we have seen at least k, then this here says we have seen at least k plus 1, and this is more exact. And after all, we want to reach l. And if we have also reached l minus 1, l minus 2, and so on, is redundant, but doesn't matter. Okay? So just to keep in mind that here we really also derive redundant information, but it doesn't matter because we will get to our goal. And in the same way, things work with the negative literals, right? For each, for each uh, negative literal here, we have a, also a pair of rules and with a, with more or less with the same idea. So we are at a position, we have counted at least k elements. If we figure out that um, minus aj is, uh, is, is, is true, or that aj is not in the current stable model candidate, then we augment the counter, and otherwise it stays the same. And here as well, in case this negative literal holds, uh, the, both rules will apply. And at the end of the day, here at position n plus 1, because we have n elements and position n plus 1, we initialize the counter with 0, and then more or less from, from this position on with a 0, we more or less move and look at each literal from, from the right to the left until we arrive here, and then hopefully we have seen uh, at least L uh, satisfied literals. Let's look at our example. I just reproduced our example from slide 101 in the first bullet here. So we have one cardinality rule which derives A if at least one among B and C is true and we have a fact that says B is uh, unconditionally true. And of course this gives us a stable model A and B because since we have B well, at least one, one element of this set is true, the cardinality constraint is satisfied, and we derive A. Now, as before, more or less, the cardinality rule is more or less the, the syntactic construct that we want to uh, translate back into normal rules, and we just do this according to the recipe we've seen on the previous slide. So here it is. Um, so the actual cardinality rule is replaced by the very first rule, which says that at position one, uh, including position one, up to the right, looking at all uh, literals to the right, we have seen at least one 
literal that is a one atom here that is true. This is more or less what this here says. So more or less the comparison with the, the lower bound is done here by, by choosing this literal by putting um, a one in the second position, right? Okay. Otherwise, the whole thing more or less uh, proceeds from the, from the right here, from position one, position two, and position three, where we initialize the counter with zero. And now I will not go through all of the rules. Let me just give you the derivation of things, because of course this is redundant. And if you look at it, you will see a lot of rules actually are uh, completely redundant and we wouldn't need them. But well, anyway, let's just follow the derivation and see where, uh, what, what we get. So at position three, our counter is zero. Now, if we have three zero and we, we had seen uh, C, well, then we could augment the counter, but we have no C, we, have, we only have B here, right? So this means uh, at position two, we've also only seen zero. So our counter uh, continues, but we haven't seen uh, a true literal so far. Well, this is now different here, where in case we have B and we are at that position here, we can augment the counter and go one step further to the left. Okay, and actually this gives us x11. We have seen our b in this case, and this applies, gives us, well, this makes this rule applicable. We have this, we, we derive this atom, which more or less stands for the cardinality constraint here, and the cardinality rule applies, and we get a, and we're done. So this, this is it, right? And so we get a stable model, which contains a and b, which is exactly what we had before. This is more or less the original language, plus a bunch of auxiliary predicates, x30, saying that at the very beginning we have seen nothing, then we move, if we move over c, we, we don't see anything, anything more, and then when we move to position 1, there we have seen 1, and here we see, we see actually that the other redundant rule applies as well. So at position 1, we have seen at least 0 elements, or 0 literals to be true, but at position 1, we've also seen at least 1. So this is actually the stronger statement here and this allows us actually to derive this. This is the redundant, this is more or less reflects the redundancy you've seen before. Whenever I can augment the counter, I also fire the rule where it doesn't augment. Good. So this, this I hope was, uh, uh, well, it's, it's technical, right? I, I, I agree with that. And again, um, the way things are set up is, is, I would say, is the easiest way, but gives a lot of redundant rules. But this is something for you to, to, to work out a little bit by yourself. So we have now seen actually how we can embed cardinality rules in normal rules. Interestingly, the inverse works just as well. So we can take each normal rule like this and represent it as a cardinality rule like this, where we stipulate that at least n uh, elements of an n-ary body uh, are true. So we always have to count the body and then put here the cardinality of that. So we could also somehow have this as a primitive for, for our rules, but well, this is more, more, this is just, of, I think, of acad academic uh, interest, not really in, in practice, and I just show it to you, right? Good. So, well, now we have seen actually pretty restricted uh, cardinality rules. Let's actually look next at more general settings. So first of all, let us extend cardinality rules with upper bounds. So I guess you've already seen such uh, cardinality constraints with a lower and an upper bound before, but now actually we finally make this precise. Well, just for the record, both the lower and the upper bound are non-negative integers, and well, we've seen this that the lower bound says at least L elements of the set must be satisfied by the current stable model candidate, and now the upper bound said that it can only be at most U elements. Okay, I guess intuitively it's pretty clear what this uh, language construct means, so let us map it again onto no, back onto normal logic programs. And as before, we do this by using auxiliary uh, atoms, but now actually we have the advantage that we already have seen how certain language constructs, for instance, cardinality rules only with a lower bound can be mapped. And so hence we can only map them back onto these ones and then we use the translations we had before. So this is how we can map cardinality rules with upper bounds. So, as before, we introduce two auxiliary literals, actually atoms x and y. And now the, the trick more or less is that we take the upper bound and 
generate a rule that says that, that more or less detects for us with the lower bound that there are u plus one, so the upper bound plus one elements in this set. And this actually means that the upper bound would be falsified because we have one more element as we are allowed to put in the set. So if this is the case, if, if our upper bound is violated, we derive y. For the lower bound, we just, well, more or less drop the upper bound and we have a cardinality rule as we had it before. This is the standard cardinality rule. And if this is satisfied, we derive x. And now what we have to make sure is that the lower bound is satisfied so that we get x and that the upper bound is not violated so that we do not get y. This is exactly what is written here in the body. So if, if we have at least l elements, and not u plus not u or more no no not u plus one or more elements, then we can derive our original hat, which is a zero. So explaining this the other way around, we take this rule here and replace it with this rule. And here we have two auxiliary uh, literals. The first literal tells us if the lower bound constraint is satisfied, and this is implemented by this rule. And the second literal, the, neg the negative literal, tells us that the upper bound is not violated and this is implemented by this rule. And now, of course, we can go on. And since we now have standard cardinality rules that only have a lower bound, we can just apply the translation that we have seen before to map this further onto normal rules. So here we go. This is actually how we can have cardinality rules with upper bounds. Okay, so last but not least, I know I've been using the term cardinality constraint many, many times so far, and I hope that it was intuitively clear, but actually here we see it more or less for the first time. An expression like in the body here where we have a lower bound and an upper bound on a set of literals, this is typically a cardinality constraint. So it's a, you can see this as a literal, which has a more complex form. Okay. Good, so these are cardinality rules with upper bounds. You may have noticed that so far all cardinality constraints were in the body. Hence, let us now look at what happens when we put them in the header rules. So here is a rule with a cardinality constraint in the head. It's a full-fledged cardinality constraint with a lower and an upper bound and positive and negative literals. Unlike this, I kept the body simple and just used ordinary uh, literals. Okay, now the question is, if a cardinality constraint ap appears in the head and in the body, is there a difference? And yes, there is. In both cases, you check actually that the conditions imposed by the lower and the upper bound on the elements in the set are satisfied, right? This is checking the cardinality constraint. But what is new here, or what, what is actually again another quality uh, of cardinality constraints in the head, that they also allow for adding atoms to the stable model. Right? Let's make an example first. So this is the example that you may remember from graph coloring. And the, first of all, note that this is a cardinality constraint that appears in the head of a rule. It is a fact, right? There is no body. This is a fact. So this is actually a very special instance of this rule here, just that we have no, no body. And again, you have already seen uh, several uh, examples of this type. So it's more or less a non-deterministic choice. So you can color node 2 with red, green or blue. But you're only, select, only able to select one of the choices, or one, here one of the atoms, at least one, and at most one, so exactly one, right? So it's on the one hand side, you have to verify that you select at least and at most one element of the set. But once you selected it, it becomes part of the stable model. And this adding elements of the set as part of the stable model is the new quality that cardinality constraints and heads uh, bring to the table. Another thing that should also be, well, I don't know, obvious, but anyway, I, uh, is you can only add atoms to the stable model, right? So it's only about A1 to AN. These guys can be added, but more or less, if, if this guy here is satisfied, well, it, it does not really add anything to the stable model, rather a m plus 1 has to stay outside. And in case it is falsified, uh, it just says, well, 
nothing about AM plus one, somebody else has to get a derivation for it. Okay, good. So let's, before I do more blah blah, I zip it again and uh, let's look actually what this really means by looking at a translation. So this is the translation. This works again with the uh, auxiliary atoms X and Y and it's roughly actually the uh, the same as with cardinal T constraints by adding upper bounds, just that now we have here an additional choice rule that allows us to choose an arbitrary subset of the positive literals in the cardinality constraints and add them to the stable model candidate at hand, provided that the body is satisfied. So, but again, one thing at, at a time. Now, the role of X more or less is, as we've seen it before, is to indicate when the rule applies, when the body has been satisfied, right? This is the first, this is our body from, from up here. And if this, if all conditions are satisfied, this is signaled by X. Okay, so once this is the case, we can, as I said, choose any subset of, of the positive literals in the original cardinality constraint and add them to the, to the stable model. Now, why simply tells us whether the, the cardinality constraint is satisfied. This is the check. This is not a generation, this just checks the condition, right? So this is just a copy of this cardinality constraint here, but now in the body, and here the condition is checked. So if it is true, Y is obtained. Okay, and at the end of the day, we, um, this rule is then satisfied uh, if, it, if, it, if the body is derivable and the condition uh, is not falsified. And this is expressed by this integrity constraint that, is, that says it must not be the case that the body, that the rule is applicable, but the constraint in the head is not uh, satisfied. And, and what one sees is actually that to satisfy this constraint, right, and to make actually y, uh, y true, we may actually add an arbitrary number of these of these uh, of these atoms to the stable model. This is of course the way how, how these how, how they interact, right? How the how the positive atoms interact with the satisfaction of the of the condition. And this, last but not least, is then the semantics of uh, cardinality constraints in the heads. Okay, now that we have seen one cardinality constraint either in the body or in the in the head, let us now look at rules that have them all over the place. So this is such a rule with cardinality constraints all over the place. So a triple L as you just is an abbreviation for cardinality constraints. We have a lower bound and an upper bound and the set uh, S contains positive and negative uh, literals, right? And then we have here N such cardinality constraint in the body and the one index with zero is the one in the head. Again, well, this is perhaps a bit academic in the sense that such beasts never occur in wildlife, but nonetheless, what I like about this is nicely summarizes the translation of cardinality constraints in the body and in the head. Okay, so let's look at the translation. So again, we uh, look at um, auxiliary atoms. Um, and in fact, for all of them, so from, from cardinality constraints zero to, to n, we have uh, these rules here that indicate whether the, the cardinality constraint, the condition more or less, is satisfied. And to this end, we use again the trick that we learned when we looked at a cardinality constraint with upper bounds. So we decompose such a constraint into one with only a lower bound, and this gives us a cardinality rule. And so whenever we derive y, we know that the lower bound of the respective uh, cardinality constraint is satisfied and whenever we derive a z we know that the upper bound has been violated because again the upper bound said at most u literals should be satisfied and here we know, already know that u, at least u plus one are satisfied in SI so good and then this uh, for, 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 uh, for the cardinality constraints one to n we add we check the, the y and the z here, more or less set, making sure that here the lower bound is satisfied and the upper bound is not violated. That's why we use this here negatively. Now, if we derived all the y's and, and the negation and make sure that none of the z's is derivable, we made sure 
that all cardinality constraints in the body are satisfied. And this is again a nice summary of how to encode cardinality constraints in the body. Now for the head we have additionally uh, these three rules, but additionally means we also have these guys here. So also for cardinality constraint 0 we get a, a y0 and, and a z0 that tell us whether it is where the conditions are satisfied. But in addition here, once we made sure that all cardinality constraints in the body, that is these guys, uh, are satisfied, we can derive x, and x will in turn allow us to derive all atoms in the set uh, of literals that make up S0. Keep in mind this plus notation here goes back to the positive bodies. That was the notation when we introduced syntax of rules. Okay, so here is said again. So S0 plus gives us all atoms in S0, and this is a set of literals. Just as we've seen it before, right, we have a cardinality constraint, and once this more or less applies, we may actually choose freely among the posit its positive literals, its atoms. And this is what this, uh, what this, what this um, rule here gives us. And so again, Adding atoms or not to the, to the stable model candidate influences the conditions, right? So the, if here would be a zero, we, by adding different atoms here, we influence the conditions here. Okay, these are the guys we derive. These are the guys we can derive from via this cardinality concept, the atoms in this set. So once the body is satisfied, we are free to derive any subset. And now we also have to make sure that um, uh, that none of the conditions is violated, and again, once the the once the um, uh, the body of the rule is derived, it must not be the case that the lower bound is false, and it must not be the case that the upper bound has been violated. 